Hey everyone, today we're going to take a look at Nagara. This is both a simple and a complex topic, depending on how far down the rabbit hole you want to get. Broadly speaking, uh, when we say the word Nagara, all we're saying is correcting stone. Uh, this can indicate a stone that you use, or sometimes even an apparatus that you use, to correct the stone. Um, that you're working on. And typically when you're using it in that context, you're referring to the base stone. You are correcting the surface of the base stone that you have that you're primarily working the blade on. Alternatively though, the term correcting stone can actually refer to a, a bench nagara, a bench sized stone. When it's used in that context, uh, it is referring to correcting the blade or correcting uh, the bevel or whatever application the bench nagara has uh, that you're going to be using it for. <clears throat> so it can initially lead to a little bit of confusion on the topic because you can have the term being used for both a handheld stone and a bench sized stone. Additionally, uh, to add a little bit to the confusion, you can find uh, a lot of the time that the handheld nagara is of the same origin as the bench nagara. <clears throat> this is usually because the qualities that make uh, a piece of stone desirable for a handheld nagara also end up with desirable qualities in the bench sized stone. Today uh, we're going to be talking about the handheld nagara, and this is the more common use of the word uh, when we say nagara. If you're, if you're online or <clears throat> you're talking to other people and you were to say nagara, uh, most people are going to think you're talking about something like this, uh, a stone that you will use to rub on the surface of your primary whetstone for a variety of reasons we'll get into. So if you have questions about the bench size Nagara, uh, I will have a separate video, I, I suppose, to cover that. Um, and I already have at least one or two uh, full length feature videos, if you want to call them that, about individual bench Nagara that, that you could take a look at. <clears throat> so anyway, today we are talking about these handheld Nagara. So the purpose of all of these stones will be to, to rub them on a bench stone that we use for whatever our application is, whether that's knife sharpening, knife polishing, blade polishing, razor use, uh, nagara can be useful in all those applications. So the first thing we're going to jump into is kind of some of the exceptions uh, to the rule so that we can get them out of the way and then talk about the more traditional nagara moving forward. So there are three uh, apparatus here that we could call a nagara, and you may hear referred to as nagara. That is, this may be a misuse of the word a little bit. Uh, the function of them is exactly the same as a regular nagara, but given that the term nagara means correcting stone, uh, these are not necessarily uh, going to fall into those applications. So the first is what we would call a diamond plate. Uh, often you will hear these referred to as diamond nagara. Uh, they do serve a similar purpose to traditional actual <clears throat> stone nagaras. Um, and that application is, of course, to either flatten uh, your whetstone out, to generate slurry on the stone itself, or to condition the surface of the stone itself for a particular application. All of these stones can be used in one of those ways. Generate slurry, flatten the stone, condition the surface of the stone. <clears throat> so there are some pros and cons to diamond nagara. Uh, one of the pros of a diamond nagara is that it offers you a true flat surface. So if you are going to flatten your whetstone out, these are preferred over a traditional nagara because <clears throat> the traditional nagara, of course, you're only working portions of the whetstone at once, uh, whereas this, you can work a broad surface and it provides you that relatively true flatness. The second application that diamond nagara can be good for is when uh, you do not have a actual tomo nagara on hand, 
we'll get into what exactly a tomonagari is later. Uh, but to put it in more simple terms, these are good when you want to generate slurry from just the base whetstone itself. Of course, if we take one of these natural stones, these natural nagara, and we rub it onto the surface of a different whetstone, you're going to not only get particles from this mixed into your water to create your slurry, but you're going to get particles from the base whetstone itself. The abrasion will kick up particles from both. Um, and that would leave us what we could call an impure slurry. That doesn't mean that it, it doesn't work or it has any problems, but it has elements from both the nagara we have used and the whetstone we rubbed the nagara upon. These diamond plates, though, <clears throat> Um, obviously are not stone themselves. In an ideal circumstance, they do not contribute anything to the slurry, and you will get a pure uh, slurry based off of just the whetstone itself. Now I say ideal circumstance because one of the risks of using a diamond nagara is that these little embedded diamonds could come off into the slurry of the whetstone. Uh, this isn't super frequent, it is much more frequent to have the diamonds dislodge at the very beginning and the very end of the diamond nagara's life. Usually, uh, when you buy a new diamond nagara, it's common to take a, a harder, thicker whetstone that you have and just uh, condition the surface of the diamond nagara a little bit to knock off any loose diamonds. Wash that slurry away, don't use it. Um, and then when you start seeing it get to the end of its life, this is a perfect example, you can see how the um, base material under our diamonds is starting to be exposed here. Um, and when you start seeing that happen, uh, it likely means that we have worn away that surface and it does put these, this area at risk for losing some, some of its um, diamonds into your slurry. So you kind of want to condition it to get off anything that's from the factory, not as secure as it could be. And if you start seeing wear, uh, you know, you should probably take that as a sign to replace the actual diamond pad, which you can buy pads and, you know, put them back on. If you have a fancy one like this with a handle, uh, you may want to do that. Sometimes people will just have ones that are the the metal block itself without the handle. In those cases, uh, it would still be cheaper to get the pad, but you're only saving maybe $20 from getting a whole new plate. So that's our first exception to the rule. <clears throat> I do like using uh, diamond nagara. However, they, uh, you know, are only one grit. Uh, they, are, you know, for instance, this is on the low end, the 400, this is on the high end, the 1200. You don't get really, I'm sorry, this is not a 400, this is a 140. You don't get below the 140, you don't really get above the 1200. Um, so depending on your application, you usually will find that will work. <clears throat> but for instance, if you have a really fine finishing whetstone, you don't really wanna be using the 140 on it to generate slurry. It'll really uh, chew up the surface of the stone. It'll give you slurry that probably isn't the, what you want for your application. Alternatively, if you only have this 1200 and you uh, want to use it to generate slurry on a really coarse whetstone, you're going to chew through your diamond plate rather quickly and find that it just is not generating the slurry as quickly or maybe as uh, coarsely as you would prefer. So one negative that we could say for the diamond plate is that you need probably multiples of them for different application. And uh, the other disbenefit beyond the danger of uh, losing the diamonds is that they're rather aggressive. I mean, obviously your whetstone itself, even if it's rather hard, is not going to be harder than the diamonds. And um, you will generate a lot of slurry very quickly with these, even, even at the 1200 range on a fine uh, finishing whetstone. Um, that can be good if you want to generate a lot of slurry. It can be bad if, uh, for the longevity of the stone if you don't want to generate that much slurry. So with these natural nagara, uh, you're going to find that generating slurry will take a little bit more time. It'll be a little thinner, but consequently, you're not using up as much of, of your stone every time you go to generate slurry. Um, you know, that can be a pro and a con though, depending on who you are. That a higher amount of slurry generated though is also working to keep your whetstone flatter. You know, if I generate slurry with this, 
I'm only uh, touching that much of the stone as I work across it. Naturally, I'm going to not be even across the surface of the whetstone. Overextended uses uh, that will potentially add high and low spots in our whetstone, which will then have to be flattened out anyway later. So you may find that alternating between a natural nagara and your diamond nagara could be beneficial because uh, this will help you not use as much of your base whetstone every single time. But alternating this in, uh, maybe like if, again for a finishing whetstone you'd want the 1200 or the 800 variant, um, can help to keep it flat without having to do a session where all you are doing is flattening the whetstone, which of course is naturally uh, going to be a little bit wasteful. So now that we've covered uh, the diamond nagara, we're going to go ahead and get them out of the way here. So the next somewhat, uh, you know, not to be here uh, option is a synthetic Nagara. You will find these come, like for instance, this is a King, a, a 8K King Nagara, it's a cheap one. Uh, you will find a lot of these do come in packs with synthetic whetstones. Um, this is a Nagara by name. Of course, it is a stone and it is used to correct the surface of your synthetic stone. I have it here because you may find uh, yourself with one and you may find that you're thinking about natural whetstones or you have one and you're asking, can I use my synthetic Nagara uh, on my natural whetstone? The answer is for certain purposes. Yes, uh, you could use the synthetic whetstone on your surface if you were trying to work out a high high spot on the stone or if all you were doing is correcting the flatness of your stone this would not cause any issues and in theory you could use this on the surface to generate a slurry but no one would recommend that um, generally you want to keep this to the function of again correcting the higher low spots or maybe um, fixing the edges if they get a little too sharp but the really the reason we're, we're not going to want to use this to generate slurry is that one of the major benefits to our natural whetstones are uh, the way the slurry interacts with the blade, the way the slurry and binder interact to, to break down a bit. This synthetic nagara uh, is going to introduce particles that do not break down in that manner. It's going to introduce binder that is not going to break down in that manner or, or hydrate in the same manner. Um, and you will find that your slurry is just going to act like this, uh, like whatever your synthetic nagger is. It will it will be the most prevalent part. It probably will not be the only part interacting with the blade, um, but it will f you will find it's less desirable. It's less effective than these other natural nagger. So traditionally, leave these off to the side. Uh, I would much more readily use a diamond plate first to fix the stone. However, of course, if, if you find you have a whetstone with a really bad high spot in it. Um, you're polishing and you notice it has a really bad high spot where you can just tell. Um, you could use this to avoid having to burn up one of your more expensive natural nagara uh, to fix that should you not have a diamond plate. Um, I would, I, I personally, after having the diamond plates, would, would never use this, but it's a question that comes up and it was uh, just worth covering here. So now we are on to our regular nagara. So first, as we jump in, we're going to talk about some of the general terminology and different types of uh, Nagara you'll hear commonly about. And later we'll get into how to actually use them and uh, what it looks like when we do so. Uh, so here we have the natural Nagara that we will take a look at today. Um, these all fall under Nagara, though we can delineate them in different ways. Um, and here we have some of the most common types you'll hear about. So I can kind of divide them into categories that you'll hear the most commonly about. I'll give you an overview of that before we jump into using them. So um, here is a piece of awasado uh, that we have in Nagara form. Very commonly, you will hear this referred to as a Tomo Nagara. Uh, the term Tomo Nagara means companion correcting stone or companion stone. And uh, this is probably one of the more misused terms by literal translation uh, within the natural stone hobby. Traditionally, when you use the term Tomo Nagara, what it should indicate is a perfectly matching 
Nagara to stone. So if we take, we do have two instances of actual Tomo Nagara here, and this one is the purest form of it, which is a Tushima bench Nagara and a Tushima handheld Nagara. Um, I know that these are, that this is a real Tomo Nagara of this, because when the vendor cut this for me, uh, they also cut this for me. They are from the same mother block, uh, they come from the same sourced material, and as such, uh, they perform exactly the same. This slurry, uh, when generated from this stone, is exactly the same type of slurry as generated from this stone. That means when we rub it, this handheld Nagara on the surface of this bench stone, uh, we will get a pure slurry as though we had used a diamond Nagara, but with none of the potential disbenefits of the diamond Nagara. Second, uh, and as we briefly discussed in the beginning, you can also use these stones, these Nagara stones, to con what we call condition the surface of the wet stone. What that means is, of course, if we use a very coarse Nagara on the surface of this whetstone, it'll it'll make it a rougher surface. Slurry will come up more readily. Whereas if we use a finer one, it would smooth out the surface, maybe beyond the natural inclination of the stone, making it harder to get slurry up. One of the benefits when we use a real Tomo Nagara is uh, it is perfectly balanced with the natural hardness of the base bench stone, uh, so that you get the way the stone for lack of a better way of saying it, wants to act. Uh, it'll never be so, this will never accidentally exhaust the top of your stone if it's the same material, but it'll also not be so hard as to chew up the surface uh, and make it perform a little different. What I mean by that is when you use a coarser whetstone or a coarser nagara or a coarser diamond plate on the surface of the stone, it does make the surface hard, or not harder, it makes it more coarse, it roughs it up, and when you use a blade on the surface, the stone for that first layer will not act like the rest of the stone will. Um, of course, in the case of a coarser Nagara, uh, it will act like a softer stone on the top, it'll be more friable, it'll release the slurry faster. Now, that can be interesting from a perspective of altering how the stone performs and, and as you become more advanced with wet stones and understand how to use them, that is something you can do intentionally and people definitely do intentionally. Um, the same can be true with, with smoothing out the surface of the wet stone with a finer nagara um, to make it perform differently as well. That is the concept of conditioning, is using a nagara that may be different than the base wet stones natural inclinations to alter its performance. That is a lot of experimentation. Um, you'll have to determine what you like. A lot of people will take the whetstone and use a harder nagara on it to condition it to be very smooth. A lot of people, uh, for razor use and those type of things, a lot of people will use a coarser nagara on the whetstone to condition it uh, for things like polishing, where you want the slurry to be kicked up, you don't want the stone to be fighting the blade moving across it. Uh, and there are many different applications in between. Uh, I'm, I'm not a master of all of them. So that is definitely an area for you to experiment in. Reach out to different elements uh, in the community if you are really interested in what other ways you could condition the surface of the whetstone and what those various applications are. Uh, but as always, uh, experimentation is key there and just learning through having some time on the stone will, will do you best. However, uh, if we did not have this Tomo Nagara, it would not, no matter how many of these we use, uh, we would not get the perfect match uh, that, that, that matches exactly the hardness and the fineness and the way that the stone kind of wants to perform. So this is a, the most traditional form of Tomo Nagara, a true piece of the same stone. Now, you will hear about a, the term Tomo Nagara used in a context where it's not really the same piece of stone, and that is much more common. It is not going to be very common that you find a 
Tomonagara that comes with your stone, and if you don't get the Tomonagara with your stone, the likelihood of finding a real Tomonagara afterwards is is pretty much impossible, right? You'd have to be talking to the individual person who sourced the material, and they would have to have the exact same block of stone sitting to the side for you. So if we take this concept of Tomonagara off the table, there are two other ways you will hear the term Tomonagara used, and these become more and more common. The first is in this concept, where you have two pieces of stone, these are both Aizu, and they're very similar. They look very similar, uh, used on their own, uh, they produce very similar grit, and uh, we know they are from the same source. Uh, visually, we can identify they're both Aizu uh, pieces of stone. And as such, we could consider this a Tomonagara. This is very close to the original version of Tomonagara, right? Uh, we know they're from the same geographic area, from the same mine. They perform similar. Functionally, they're a Tomonagara. Uh, this is a Tomonagara to this stone. Um, literally, you know, it's not. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we can't look and see that the pattern matches up or anything. And uh, this is, you know, a, a different piece of stone, probably not from the exact same piece of stone this was cut from. However, functionally, this is, you know, similar enough to where we could call it a Tomonagara, and a Puritan of, of using that word probably would not go, well, no, that's not a Tomonagara, uh, right? It, it's just not as pure of a version as we had with these. This is still less common of a way to use the word. Um, of course, it, it functions perfectly fine, and for me, this is where I tend to want to call the line of a Tomonagara, is where we can tell they're the same material, um, we can tell they're from the same mine, which is very uncommon outside of uh, stones like this, which have very clear visual indicators. Um, so let's put this aside now. That's the second form of Tomonagara light, if you want to call it that. The last form of Tomonagara, and this is by far the most common version of uh, the word used out there, is something like this, where we have a piece of awasado um, and then a different awasado. And we are going to use this piece of awasado to generate slurry from this base whetstone. Um, when someone says this is a Tomonagara for this stone, what they should be saying uh, what that should indicate to you is that they have tested this nagara and they find that its hardness and fineness is comparable to this base whetstone. And thus, they are saying that this functions as though it were a tomo nagara to this stone. But it is not. Most nagara out there are not a tomo nagara. Um, and the term frequently gets used as a stepping uh, stone point. Uh, like, if we have this progression here, which it is, I have it lined up here from coarse to fine, um, someone might say to go to the end of the progression and then on to the Tomonagara progression, on to the Tomonagara step. And that is not exactly what they're trying to say. They're not saying that that step has to be a perfectly matching stone. Uh, I, ideally, it would be. Um, and, but what they're saying is that you could either use your diamond plate or a matched nagara, which they are calling a tomo nagara. Um, usually, though, the matched nagara is not. In the marketplace, you're getting different stones from potentially totally different sources that you are using to generate your slurry. You're relying on the individual settling it that their matching capabilities are good. So you will have to determine... Uh, you know, if you find that acceptable, generally speaking, it may be your only option. And if you can't source a stone with a real Tomonagara, um, where you're dealing with a stone that doesn't have visual indicators, like an Aizu piece, uh, you, will, you will have to test it and run with it, or use diamond plate. The diamond plate will give you the functional Tomonagara slurry, because it will generate that pure base slurry um, alone. And function similar. So you'll have to make that choice about 
your feelings on Tomo Nagara. Um, there are definitely people out there who are very capable at matching Nagara. Um, but broadly speaking, it is a little bit of a misuse of the word, but it's so commonly used that it's important to understand what people are saying when they say, use your Tomo Nagara or move on to the Tomo Nagara step. What they're really just trying to say is use a Nagara with a similar quality as your base whetstone to generate this stage of slurry. Um, so that is a Tomo Nagara. Um, and, it, and it can, like, for instance, this is a Nakatoishi. This is not a finishing stone. We would still call this a Tomo Nagara of that. And that's kind of what can make that, that phrase confusing is because if you say the Tomo Nagara stage, what they're really saying is the Tomo Nagara stage for an Awasato, almost always, uh, which means just, you know, what they're really indicating in the end is a matching whetstone of very fine quality, literally fine, um, to a awasato of literally fine grit quality. So keep that in mind as you're looking at Nagra and trying to get your handle on the topic that that is what they're talking about. So let's put this aside until later. So next up we have just regular Nagara. In this case we'll take a look at these two. We do have a piece of Aizu here. Um, when it's not trying to be matched or used with another Aizu block, right, it just becomes a regular Nagara. Similar to this. This is a regular Nagara if it is not properly matched to a stone. Uh, this is also a regular Nagara. All of these can be regular Nagara, um, but these ones in the front are delineated and they have a, a clear grit uh, stepping order, whereas these uh, do not. Um, they might be known entities, like this is a Gujo Nagara. Uh, this is a known entity. It's a soft Nagara with a fairly fine grit, um, but they're still different piece to piece. Aizu is the same way, a little different piece to piece. Uh, and then of course this is just a piece of Awasato, so it is definitely different piece to piece. Um, these, though, attempt, attempt to have delineations uh, made of them that give you some expectations for as to how the Nagara will perform. We'll get into those a little bit later. The pros of this is that they're cheaper. They're cheaper, they're more readily easy to find. Um, not that these are hard to find, but really we're talking expense, is that you can get a bunch of these uh, inexpensively from other people. Sometimes they'll just trade them to you for free or you can swap them, uh, whereas these graded ones are not going to be as readily uh, done in that manner. Second, um, you can get regular Nagara here that are just the basest form of the word um, that have a far greater range. Uh, this does have a clear beginning and end versus you can get Nagara that are very coarse for primarily flattening purposes you can get Nagara that are super hard and super fine. Um, and those fall very distinctly out of this progression range. So uh, realistically, anything could be a Nagara. Um, this is generally not recommended, but I, I will explain that you could even do this. You could, in theory, take a hard base whetstone and a soft whetstone, and theoretically you could use this as a giant Nagara. Um, why you don't see people do that, which is a very standard question for people who are starting, right? Why, why should I spend money or, or look to get these when I just could buy two stones and rub them on each other? Well, the answer to that is the surfaces are both flat and as you rub them together, uh, they're going to vacuum themselves to one another. You will still even experience that with these small stones, uh, that the flat surface against the flat surface will s suck the stone a little bit on the edge and you'll feel resistance. However, with a small stone, you have an easier time breaking that seal by pulling in a direction or twisting because the seal, uh, the vacuum between the two are not as strong. Whereas with a, a big uh, Nagara, the same size, you might create a vacuum that's so strong uh, where you are going to risk breaking the stones trying to get them apart uh, because you, you've made such a powerful vacuum between the two. So generally recommend against doing that, um, but a stone like this 
that's a pretty big nagara. Uh, the size of it, though, means that you still tend to get a lot of wiggle room. You can oh, try to avoid the vacuum. And this, this could be used on pocket knives or something. So you can get, a, same with this maybe, right? Uh, you could get a little inventive with the size of your nagara and the uses of them. Um, but I wouldn't, this is a very big one. I would not go much above this if, if you want to, you know, if you're going to worry about trying to get them apart at a later time. So the general use of the term is, of course, the easiest. Again, just Nagara. Um, the difficulty comes with all the different classifications, with what is a tomo, the reference to a tomo in certain circumstances. Uh, so we can put these aside for now. You know, these do have different, way different use cases, right? This is when used on an awasedo. A Aizu Nagara uh, is going to be a very early step progression that's going to make the awasedo perform coarser and faster than it naturally would. A Gujo Nagara um, is a soft Nagara. It'll generate pri usually primarily slurry from the Nagara itself. And Aizu will be a mix because it's a little harder, a little coarser. And this is used usually for a middle step for helping to fine up the blade or fine up the polish. Um, and then your actual awasedo nagara is going to be used at the finishing stages to give you that slurry uh, that you want to finish your knife or razor or what have you on. So these all fall within the nagara class and it's up to you to figure out which ones you need for what application. And that brings us to our Mikawa nagara. That last sentence I just said is somewhat critical. Uh, the concept that with regular Nagara, you have to figure out which ones you want at what steps. One of the major benefits to this Makawa lineup is that uh, you, or to, to a certain degree, you can take yourself out of the equation. That um, they have been rated to a loose degree, but still uh, to an acceptable one, from coarsest to finest, um, and they have a semi-predictable quality about them. So if you're new to natural whetstones, and you have no idea how an Aizu performs, or when to use an Aizu, or you have no idea how Gujo performs, or even the terms that I use don't really help you figure it out, you can find plenty of information online, both on naturalwetstones.com and, and plethora of other resources out there that will help you understand when would you use each of these, what are the qualities that they bring to the table. Um, they're a very known entity. So if you're going to just buy one Nagara and you want to make sure it works for your application, this can help guide you by finding the right one somewhere in the progression. Um, that is the primary benefit of these, outside of uh, that they are good stone. Um, the Mikawa stone is a little unique, um, and, but, but it falls in line with what we would call most traditional Nagara stones to be, which is that it's a very fine, softer stone, um, and that the stone itself frequently plays a little bit of a factor in how it polishes or how it cuts uh, the blade's edge. So, um, there are pros and cons, of course, to the system, as there are to any system. And before we jump into the pros and cons and what each of these steps are, it is a little important to remove some of the, uh, let's call it romantic mythology behind the Mikawa lineup here. Um, understanding a little bit about the background of why they were made and um, the use case of them will help to put them into a better perspective of what, what Nagara are, what their value to you may be. So the uh, Mikawa Nagara lineup will generally be the most commonly known lineup uh, in razor users. They're very, it's very popular for people who hone razors and uh, for many, I think it's taken on a mythical status of uh, the best way or the most traditional way to do it. Um, I'm not necessarily saying it it is or is not, uh, I think that's up to each individual. But if we look at the use case um, and the, the reason it was developed, it will give you, uh, as the person trying to make some decisions here, a uh, better understanding of why they exist and maybe your view of them. So um, 
this lineup was made, uh, and I'm going to be a little bit more general if you want a broader history on this, uh, there are, are other websites out there um, that are, do it better even than naturalwetstones.com. I think Japan Stones uh, does it really well. Um, and if you go on to naturalwetstones.com and into the additional information area, you can find links to many different websites that will that cover this with pictures and specific dates. Uh, but for our purposes, I'm just going to keep it a broader story. So this was made in the 1950s uh, by two different men. Um, the primary one for our story here being Iwasaki, um, but Sakamoto also played, was the second one who played a major role in things. Um, and the way that it goes is uh, back in the day for Japanese barber use for razors, uh, they used whetstones that we would typically call like a 3.5 out of 5 hardness. So they're very fine. Uh, so they're on the finer side, but they're very soft and they're easy to use. Um, these were the, arguably the more desired ones, and uh, there was enough natural whetstone coming out of the mines in the region that uh, they were plentiful. By the 1950s, those were starting to become a little bit more scarce. Uh, the quality of them was e either more dubious or harder to find. And what was becoming proliferated on the market that was available was uh, harder uh, whetstones. Now, one of the, or two of the major important things to realize about the story is, unlike today, uh, diamond plates did not exist. So a lot of really hard whetstones are coveted today because when you use a diamond plate on them, you can generate really fine slurry, um, and that works really well for razors. But uh, in the 1950s, without a diamond plate, uh, that was seen as an impediment. Uh, it was really hard to find a nagara that would generate the right slurry, uh, and generally speaking, um, they were considered inferior stones, and they were cheaper, less desirable. Um, and the second thing to note is that synthetic stones uh, were not out or were not out in mass. Uh, like the King 1000, which kind of helped to revolutionize things in that field, had not been released yet, uh, and Iwasaki and his peers viewed the future uh, as a natural whetstone future, that everybody would be using those stones to continue to sharpen their blades. So in a world where you are uh, losing the softer, easier to use stones, where you didn't really need a nagara, or you could just use kind of any ho-hum nagara to flatten it out and keep doing your work uh, from a business perspective, um, the, it was important to adapt to a world where all you had were these very hard uh, stones. And Iwasaki went looking uh, amongst the various forms of nagara that were common at the time and found that the Mikawa nagara were very consistent, uh, were predictable, and you could look at the strata or the layer of earth that they came from in the mine and delineate more than not how they would perform. Uh, so when we're looking at this, we have uh, here the different strata of the mine, and they, they are graded. Uh, they're not layered in the earth in this way. They're graded in this manner um, to say, you know, that this strata performs coarsely, this strata is middle ground, the strata is finer, etc. Now, that's in relation to the scale offered here. Uh, what we're really talking about is kind of like a a, a 1k analogous on the Japanese wet scale to like a, a 6k analogous and then there, there's the range in between. Um, <clears throat> so he found that these stones uh, worked really well. Um, Sakamoto uh, was the mine, became the mine owner with him and uh, there are some other players as well in there. Um, but generally speaking they procured the rights to this this material and uh, they set up a grading system so that the Japanese barbers could buy a series of nagara for a low to use on a lower quality hard whetstone, um, and still uh, continue to be able to you know keep their business running. So that's the context in which we find that these were made, um, that these were produced, and the craft was you know forged, if you want to call it that. So first, of course, there's tradition there, but but that's it's just the 1950s. That's not that long ago. You know, we're not talking about how ancient the stones are in general, which is back to I don't know the 1300s or something like that. 
from Japan. Some of them, of course, not all. Um, so it's, it's cool. I mean, it's a cool tradition. Uh, it certainly works if you if you buy the progression and they're, they're good quality versions of them. It does work rather well uh, on a razor edge. Um, but we have some differences uh, in the world today that we didn't have back then. Of course, there are synthetic stones. There are diamond plates. Um, and the truth of the matter is if you go from a, you know, middle grade Nakatoishi or a middle grade synthetic stone and jump to a really hard awasado that you generate your slurry with a diamond plate through, uh, the end result is going to be probably just as good as if you run through this progression. Um, the progression can help by an inexperienced user by ensuring you remove your scratches because it will force you to spend more time <laughs> at the middle stages. However, um, you know, if you're looking with a jeweler's loop or uh, you have experience, um, you, you can do those things without any of this progression, whether you do it through Nagra that you grade yourself, synthetic stones, or again, uh, a couple different bench stones with the diamond plate. So um, that is the first thing that is really important to cover. Uh, Iwasaki didn't have diamond plates. I'm sure that would have totally changed his opinion. He didn't have synthetic stones, which to be frank, for who Iwasaki was, there's a very good chance that this wouldn't have existed if there were um, synthetic stones because he isn't like the hobby. You know, he wasn't saying, oh, you gotta always use natural stones because they're cool or they offer a minorly different edge. He was looking to keep businesses running. Um, now it has turned into a tradition though, a saw, you know, saw after part of a hobby. And um, of course they continue to get sold and actually the ancestor of one of them, a Sakamoto, is the one who continues to grade these and uh, produce them. You can find a link to his Japanese Bai store uh, on the reputable resellers page of the Natural Whetstones website. Uh, and I generally suggest everybody, you know, buy your stones from him if you can function, uh, if you can use Bai in that capacity. Bai does not work for every type of auction. It does not work for every country. Uh, and there are other people who sell these stones if you can't use Bai, but of course, if you can buy straight from the guy who, who grades it uh, and is the historic owner, uh, you'll be better off. And he also has the best prices. So there's that too. So uh, with that said, these are very nice Nagara. Uh, they're good to use. They have really good applications. And when you kind of step back from that uh, mythology and tradition of it, um, they are very nice, uh, but I think they're better taken as individual Nagara than they really are as, as a full progression with, a, with that mythology behind it. So, um, we will, I will still go through the progression and what you might use them for. Traditionally, we see the progression start about here for Razor users from this one onward, but we do have these earlier examples uh, that can have a use as well and are sold and you can find them for, for different purposes. Um, one of the disbenefits before we jump into that and why I think it was really important to put all of this into the proper perspective is that these are, relatively speaking, to this these type of Nagara, very expensive um, in today's market. Uh, two of these stones might run you the whole price of your finishing stone. Three of them might run the whole price of this stone. Um, they That mythology, that tradition, the nice kanji on it, the grading that is easy to use for a beginner, which has a real application, of course, um, ha has driven the price up though. And for some of them, like Koma, the scarcity of it, whether real or manufactured, it doesn't matter. There's not as much of it on the market and uh, the price it can be very high per gram. Uh, so when you're trying to practically look at these things, you're not going to steer towards them. You're going to steer away from them into, into other areas where you can leverage your money for a more amount of stone. Uh, maybe if you're being totally pragmatic, you would circle back to this topic as an interesting point later after you've gotten far more useful stones for your money. However, if you still find that you're attracted to the idea, you think it's cool, you like the history, I mean, there's a million reasons why you, should, you could do it. Of course, I have it. Uh, I, I don't think I knew everything I know now about them when I started getting them. Um, but I have them now and I keep them for examples and 
to play around with, and uh, I do have some bench stone versions of these, which has which can have different applications, and I frequently will use these as Tomo Nagara uh, for those bench stones, or Tomo-ish Nagara, right, based on our previous conversation. So uh, with all of that said, with the caveats on it, again, I think these are cool, I think they have real use, expenses high, mythology makes them more important than maybe they probably should be, uh, and individually they can be really nice. So let's go ahead and jump into what they are. I'll briefly cover what the stamps are and uh, the grading of it, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, so first uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at some of these stamps, uh, kanji stamps. So I don't have every single different type to demonstrate to you. Uh, I only have what's called the white version of the stone. Um, there is a little bit of a difference between the white version and the striped version. Uh, they have different kanji on them to indicate white for striped. Um, the biggest difference between them is look. They look different. Um, in my opinion, the slurry, getting the slurry to a workable point, hydrated, can feel a little different between the white versions and the striped versions. However, one of the most important things to walk away with is that functionally there is no difference. Uh, they polish the same, they hone the same, they sharpen the same. So uh, if you're in the market, you know, if you try a bunch, you may find that you have a preference for one versus the other. I do, I like the white ones better. However, there's no difference between them. So don't sweat it unless if you get a lot of that experience, then you can pick and choose as you want. Broadly speaking, my opinion, the white ones are a little bit grittier uh, and uh, the the and thinner in the slurry. The striped ones tend to be like a little creamier in the slurry. Uh, the reason I like the thinner ones is that I feel like I can control the slurry better. I can get a better feel for how thin or thick it is and how much is there. The striped ones are nice. They're like I said, they're really creamy and that can be good. Um, in certain circumstances, but I preferred the like ability to hone in, uh, pun intended, I guess, uh, on how I wanted the slurry to form. So anyway, we'll just go ahead and use this guy here. So we have, these always have four stamps, uh, if they are graded in this manner and of the newer variety. Um, I don't know exactly when all these stamps were implemented. In the very beginning, though, the stamps were not exactly this way. They've been They've gotten to this point, but for many, many years now they've been this way. Um, so we'll run through what the stamps are. This is the Asano Evaluated Stamp. This red one, it's telling you it has been formally evaluated by Asano. Uh, he was uh, involved in the process and was the first one to grade it, um, to grade these in the very beginning. Uh, now Sakamoto, who is you know owns the stockpile of this stone, also is the one who has inherited uh, the stamp, and his son, so another Sakamoto, will will inherit the stamp. I'm sure some someday soon. Uh, this larger kanji stamp down here is basically telling you it's from the Mikawa mine. That's not the literal translation of it, um, but it it's telling you it's the Shiro version of the Mikawa mine. This one without the box on it that are two kanji and sometimes up to up to three, which we have a three kanji one here, um, is telling you whether it is a white version uh, or a striped version. Um, now you can see that the kanji are the same here and these are both white versions. Um, this third kanji here is telling you it is a squared shaped white version. This is not a square shaped white version. The striped is the same way. Uh, they have different kanji. And then there is a designator for a square striped and then a, a you know, lack of a third designator for a regular non-square striped. Again, uh, that is just the look of it. And you may find yourself having a preference, but functionally I have used both and they, they, they all work the same at each level. And then the last one, uh, which are sometimes two kanji, sometimes three kanji, um, but as you can see the designation, or not the designation, the orientation of these is always the same, so you can track it down, um, is the strata it is from. Uh, and that is usually the most important one, right? That's going to be the one that tells you actually how it functions. The rest are either, you know, two of them of course are about 
where they're from, who graded it, which is always the same if it's from the authentic source. And then one of them is just about visual looks. So it's really that last strata one that's gonna be the most useful. So we'll run through them. Uh, this is not as commonly found. Uh, you can find it pretty common from Sakamoto, but it's not floating around the market as much. It's called Mushi. It is the most coarse of the Mikawa Nagara. And it's, it's probably around one uh, to one and a half K or something like that. Um, not used in razors, which is why it's a lot less known. Um, this could be a fine nagara for, for knife uh, sharpening work, you know, just to flatten out the stone or to get slur going. You can find these for cheap, so if you want a cheap Mikawa nagara for that purpose, this could, this could work for you and still give you an, an idea of what you're working with. Ban, uh, sometimes mistranslated as van, uh, is the next step up from that. Uh, it is, all of these, as you will find, are very small gradient steps from one another. So if, if our Mushi was a 1 to 1.5, this is like a 1.5 to 2. So just a minor step up. It has basically the same application as Mushi. Um, and given that with knife sharpening, you're not usually moving in just 500 increments. Um, uh, you're going to probably pick, you pick one or the other. Usually Bon is the one that you are going to find. This is Atsu. Uh, it kind of starts to make the bridge between the coarser ones and the arguably more fine one. Um, I do like this quite a bit, and depending on the Atsu you get, uh, it is the first step which could be viable for razor work. These are too coarse, They're, they may chip the blade. And I know that for synthetic stones, we say, oh, we go down to a 1,000 to set your bevel. But with natural stones, a 1,000 natural stone, it's just a little too likely. Unless if you're really sure of the quality, it's a little too likely it could have particles in there that might chip your razor. So I would stay away from these for razor work. Atsu, maybe. Um, you would have to agree, you'd have to use it and see for yourself. If you're trying to play it safe, avoid, avoid this one for razor work. Next up, uh, we have the two botans. Um, this is interesting in the sense that uh, there were different mines and different mine layers, and there are technically two different layers which perform very similar. Um, and in one mine, there was only one layer of botan, and the other mine, there were two layers of botan. Uh, but they function very similar. Uh, this is actually called haji botan, um, but it in English, it's written like yay botan. Um, and this is a usually known as a little coarser than this one, but they both break down fairly similarly. Just the binder in this is a little more resilient. So you'd, you could work it a little bit longer. Um, you could interchange these around in a stepping order. So realistically, maybe it's more like this for our progression. Um, up to you though, you make that choice. So we have Haji Boten. We have regular botan, and this is where most razor progressions would begin. Um, sorry, Atsu, maybe uh, 2.5 to 3K. Uh, 3K, 3K-ish, um, if we're trying to keep that stepping order. So we have our botan, and, and when most people say a four-step progression for Makawa, they're going to start at both after setting a bevel on a 1k synthetic or something else they would start here next up we have tenju um this is of course a step from botan up around 4k to 5k it can have the largest uh variable in my opinion i found ones that cut coarser and are a little coarser i found ones that that don't so you'll have to test yourself but it still functions as that middle step and uh also similar to botan there are actually in some mines, there are two layers of tenju, but uh, they function interchangeably to the point that they're, they're marked exactly the same, so you, you don't know. Um, I find this to be a really good all-around Nagara. So if you're looking at this progression, <clears throat> this tends to be cheaper than the ones to the finer side. Um, it tends to be about, usually it's actually even cheaper than the Botan stuff based on, I think, today's market and it functions differently than those. So you could get like a ban and a tenju 
and then something that is a Tomo Nagara. And this would give you a cheaper, a somewhat synonymous progression that you could use on a blade. Maybe you spend a little bit more time on each step. Um, again, if you were razor work, I would, I would avoid this. I would set the bevel on either a, a more validated stone or a synthetic, and then you could use these two. So I think the Tenju plays really well for that. So after our Tenju, uh, we move up to Majiro. Get the this is a little bit marked strangely, so so you can see the kanji. Um, and Majiro is probably five to six k. And really, when we're talking about the progression, interestingly enough, there's a lot of debate on the this last step once you hit Majiro and above. Um, Iwasaki in his book on razor honing, which uh, there is a copy on naturalwetstones.com, but you can also find it uh, plentifully everywhere. Uh, it was distributed, it is distributed for free um, and translated by some people in the community who deserve some major praise. Uh, and it's an interesting book, and you'll notice that in it, he only briefly mentions, it, without the intention of using it, any step after coma or after Majiro. So coma, the step we usually will say after it, is actually not mentioned very frequently. And uh, even Sakamoto more recently has said that he doesn't use coma uh, because Majiro is as fine or finer. But when we're talking about the progression people teach, coma is on there and it's at the end. So we have Majiro, which is that five to six K. It's very, it's, it's definitely starting to get very fine. A five to six K is pretty fine. Um, and then we have coma which we would also say is exact, relatively exactly the same, five to six K. Um, do, you know, there's kind of this ongoing debate about, well, well do I need Coma then? Um, do I need it in addition to Majiro? Um, and kind of like the rest of this, right? The answer is if you want it, uh, you don't need any of this to get the job done as we've already kind of briefly hit on. One of them might be useful, the rest can be fun or offer you a more surefire grading system, but need is probably not there. Um, my understanding of why some people really like to use coma and some people don't is depends on where you fall and whether or not the coma's still very fine quality like Majiro, but a little bit more aggressive cutting power could aid you. I think some people look at it as a way to maybe get false wire edges off the blade before they move on to the really fine Tomo Nagara uh, step. Whereas people who are using Majiro, more confident that the wire edge is gone. I, that's the best conclusion I've come to as to why some people like to add in the coma. Um, one of the real disbenefits of coma is that it's by far the most expensive. It's used um, all of this could be theoretically used in sword sharpening, but this this like whole range from Atsu to Majiro would be used in a in the Chu Nagara step, which Chu Nagara doesn't even typically come from Mikawa. It comes from a different mine that's in the same region. But you could source one of these Mikawa levels, and you just call it Chu, and all of this can kind of function similar. Whereas the Koma step offers. Um, different qualities when sharpen, when polishing sword level um, tamahagane, the, the Japanese steel. So this is a certain step in that, and as such, the stock of it is very expensive. There's debate about whether or not that expense and rarity is manufactured, uh, or if it's real, uh, I don't know. You know, I'm not gonna try to even weigh in on that. It just is what it is. I do have a last one here. Uh, this is also a Mikawa Nagara. Uh, you will see it looks, of course, different. We'll use the same one, it's a coma. So it's different from this coma marking. Um, this is uh, what a lot of the very old stock looked like, used less consistent stone to stone stamps that are commonly like this blue black color. And I've seen other variants of, of this type of thing too. Some of them will have weird looking other ones of these with Asano marked still, some of them won't. Um, you just have to make sure that whoever you get it from is a reputable vendor uh, to make sure it's real. But they, those stamps for very old stock can look a, a little interesting. Generally though you're going to be looking at these and if you're 
looking to just start or, or just get one of them and ensure authenticity, these are, are going to be your better step. And again, if you can buy from Sakamoto or uh, a reputable vendor, you'd definitely go that route. And then, um, so we've kind of covered the progression of, of them. Uh, again, we go from about 1 to 1.5 to about that 5 to 6 range. And lo and behold, right at that 5 to 6 range is when we would consider the finer grit awasados to start. And then you would progress with a Awasato Nagara or a Tomo Nagara, uh, and then you'd finish, you know, water only and stropping and so on and so forth. If you want a, more information about that progression, there's some on naturalwetstones.com. But again, there's there are people, um, Alex Gilmore and uh, Keith, uh, on their respective YouTube channels, cover um, way more information about that. And I'm not going to probably sit and make a video about how to use these Nagara. Um, I'll leave it to someone who, who's, you know, far more into it, uh, I think, who really believes in it. Um, believes in the superiority of it or, or whatever. Um, so you can find their channels on the additional information page, as we mentioned before. So that gives us a general outline of these things. I will go ahead and set these up just to, uh, not these, I'll set a few stones up to just show some use cases. Um, it won't take very long, but uh, it will help you understand a little bit more about like the Tomo slurry the con and the way conditioning works and a little bit of the nuance of like a hard Nagara, soft base stone, soft Nagara, hard base stone, and how that ends up generating different percentages of uh, what type of slurry is in what type of stone. All right, so let's go ahead and get our holder here. I'm just gonna move these stones off to the side. And the first thing we're gonna just take a quick look at is the slurry from this Tushima with its Tomo. So, um, Let's go ahead and get this. So the process is fairly simple. It's kind of as you would imagine it. I do like to wet the Nagara, the handheld Nagara as well. Um, and as we rub it, these are soft stones. So you're going to see it generate readily and immediately. And there we go. We have our slurry on our Tushima bench stone. And again, the benefit is that some slurry came from our handheld, some slurry came from our base stone, but because they are the same, we have just pure one dimensional. We know exactly how it's going to perform slurry. Whereas if I was to use something more like this, even though it might generate primarily the bench Tushima, because this is harder than that, uh, it's still going to have some pieces come off. You're not going to get it where this never influences the bottom. Does that make a huge deal? Probably not. Depends on your application. But if you're going for predictability and a stepping process, this obviously gives you a far better, more pure step, if, if you want to call it that way. So that's what we would expect um, a soft stone on a a soft handheld Nagara on a soft stone to do, and in this case also what a Tomo Nagara does. I guess for the sake of exploring the Tomo style Nagara, we'll also do the Aizu here. Make sure it's in focus. So now this, these stones, are more, and here you go, look, even though we said they're very similar, you can tell they're, they're a little different. Um, I know they perform similar, we know they're both Aizu, but not the perfect match. Um, is it a Tomo? Is it not a Tomo? Whatever, up to you. Uh, so anyway, th this is a, a more medium hard, medium hard, so we'll still definitely get the slurry up, but unlike the Tushima, we might have to work a little harder at it. There. 
we do have some here. Obviously still didn't generate as much as that, but that is starting to be a usable mount. Uh, depending on what you want to do, maybe you go a little bit more, uh, but you could start there with a knife and then the surface would help to be refreshed, which is um, one of the key purposes of doing this, right? Is uh, that slurry helps to start the cutting process with the knife and having a little bit of the slurry material where you have some stone particles that are loose on the surface as you're moving the knife across it helps won't do it perfectly but does help to keep the surface a little bit more refreshed so you will find that if you start a stone with a nagara um, it'll cut a little bit longer and it'll cut more more quickly uh, than it would typically otherwise if the stone is very soft that's not as those qualities don't show as much because the stone is readily giving you more material. However, most stones are on the medium hard plus side and, and can benefit from a nagra. Okay. So next up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab this awasado here and we're gonna look at a combination where the awasado is generally speaking softer than the nagra we're going to use. So what we'll see here is mostly slurry is going to be pulled up from the base stone. Now again, as we discussed, this is still contributing something uh, to the slurry. But you're going to see that broadly it's going to be this, this color, it's not going to be white. And when I do this, I try to hold down here because uh, they want to get sucked together some. So this actually might be a better example of a truly mixed slurry. Um, it's not really purely white. It's not purely this base color. Uh, it's a, probably a 50-50 mix of both. Um, so you, this, this could be interesting to use in a world where you want to alter the benefits of this base whetstone, because we can generate a slurry that functions a little like this, a little like that. Um, in this case, right, if I know the qualities of this, which is that it's a little bit more cushiony, it's uh, a pretty fine version of a gujo, uh, gujo and um, it could add some more finesse to this base whetstone through that quality, through a slurry that is a little more long lasting, a little bit more uh, durably muddy, if you want to call it that, it doesn't get spent as quickly. I could use that to alter the process. Um, if you don't know those things though, right, that's that's not going to be, that, that quality it, it maybe less shines through a little bit less for you. So for the sake of our exercise here, I'm going to um, wash this off. And then I'm going to use one of our diamond plates. Now, as we said before, the 140 is a little too coarse for a finishing stone. So we're gonna go ahead and use our 1200. And you can see that it's basically the size. It, I mean, it is, it's a little larger than the stone itself. So typically you wanna put very little pressure on it. Even when you're using the handhelds, you don't really press down hard and we just let it do its work. And here you go, we've only gone a little bit. And you can see that we have at least an equal amount of slurry as to what we got with the Gujo. Um, but unlike the Gujo, it did not, it did not add in anything. It's, you know, pure slurry from just the base stone and thus a little bit more predictable um, about how it would function or depending on the stone, maybe finer, like this is, maybe uh, it is a little coarser than this base stone. So this slurry we just generated with the diamond plate is of a finer uh, quality. So the last thing we'll take a look at is uh, we will use the Gujo again, but in this case on a pretty darn hard whetstone. And uh, we can see that, you know, we've flipped the tables where the majority of the material will come off of our Gujo Nagara and very little of this base stone will be provided. 
the first thing you can see is how much more effort it takes just to get a little bit. The stone's much harder. And you're really just kind of taking bits of the knocker off. So here we are. And we can see now, which this base stone does not slurry white, but the Gujo does. We can see that's probably, you know, again, it's not 100%. The, the base stone is being pulled up, but that's almost purely Gujo. The Gujo Nagara uh, is, is present there. So, in a, in a circumstance where we wanted to hone a razor, this actually, which is some of the base stone that's finer than a Gujo, but the stone is softer, is softer than this one. So this is a softer whetstone that's finer still than our Nagara. This slurry generated, if I was to generate it with this, where it's a, a mix, which, you know, you got the point, um, <clears throat> may actually work better than this super hard one with almost all Gujo Nagara. And the reason, of course, is that we're getting more of our base whetstone coming to the surface. Whereas this is primarily the Nagara, because the Nagara is the coarsest of all of them, uh, we'll see that this may actually perform worse. So you have to keep that in mind as you're looking at the Nagara on the surface and what the Nagara will produce for you, how it will alter things. So when we're using these harder stones, you know, it's very important that we use a more matched Nagara. Um, so that we're getting the performance we want. Now, I know for a fact this is a, a very hard stone, um, so what we're still going to see here is the lion's share of the slurry is going to be from our Nagara here, which will come up purple. A very interesting, very interesting stone I took this small piece off of. Um, and once again, it's going a little slow because the stone we're working on is really hard. So it doesn't cut as fast as the softer stuff. But um, we still have primarily this stone to thank for generating our slurry. However, because I have worked with this Nagara before, I know this quality is similar to this base stone. It's not losing as much in translation here. Now, if you don't if we go back to the benefits of our diamond plate, potentially, when we're considering them as a viable Nagara, we could use the diamond plate on this super hard stone. And in quick time, we have our actual slurry, base stone slurry. So that's a great example of where the diamond plate, and you can see, as I had said, it doesn't really come up white. It comes up more off tan color. So we know that when we use the Gyujo, it came from the Gyujo. When we used our Tomo, it came from the Tomo. When we used our diamond plate, it came from the base stone. That's a really excellent example of where those diamond plates excel is uh, really unlocking this harder, finer stone that we spent money or traded or whatever, however you got yours, to, to use that fine quality. Um, now, in this case, I don't have to use that diamond because I know I have this, but you might not be in a circumstance where you have this. You may not know if this is finer than that, etc. So I really tend to recommend everybody looks at the 120 diamond Nagara and the 1200 diamond Nagara. Ooh. 1200 diamond Nagara. So you have the ability to flatten your stones well. You have the ability to generate slurry even at the high level of the stone range. Um, and I think once you get that these down, which really unlock the ability to work with stones and make sure you can test them and pull out their regular maximum potential, you can then throw in one Nagara, or a progression of Nagara, or Gujo, or shop around, or trade around for some Awasato, Tomo Nagara. And you, you can ex experiment from there. Um, so, you know, whether you need a Tomo, whether you need a Diamond, whether you really like these, it is a lot of personal preference as all of these, um, you know, as all natural whetstone stuff is. 
Uh, but hopefully this gave you an idea of the different Nagra, some, some nomenclature of it, uh, the Makawa lineup, pros and cons of it, and uh, what you can expect. And then our little session here just generating some slurry. I know we didn't use it, but uh, using it, I mean, you can look at all the other videos out there, whether they're mine or other people's, about what it, what it looks like when you use slurry. I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen it before if you're looking at videos. So anyway, uh, thanks for stopping by, and uh, until next time.